Thank you all for coming to this webinar. Uh, I think this is a very good opportunity uh, to talk uh, what is a very timely topic uh, for us, especially in the middle of the pandemic, COVID-19, and see how uh, the political economy and the conditions between uh, the UK and Indonesia is going on with the COVID and with the pandemic and what learn and what lessons uh, that we can learn from the both countries from UK and also Indonesia. And we're having with us today, Professor Stephen Maguire from Sussex Uni University of Sussex and also Ibu Mashita Kristalin, uh, staff khusus uh, Ibu, Menteri Keuang uh, Ibu Menteri Keuangan so it's very an honor, Ibu Mashita and Prof. Steven, to have you all here uh, to talk about how we're going forward, how we will move forward with the pandemic, especially in terms of the political uh, economy sides. Uh, but before that, I'd like to say also, I would like to say hi to people also watching us from YouTube today. So there are uh, people also watching us live on YouTube. And I also would like to say welcome to people. Uh, to uh, I think there are almost a hundred participants right now, uh, and also some in the waiting rooms that join us on the Zoom. I think it will be a great seminar and a great discussions uh, to look forward. So the theme of the webinar would be the political economy of pandemics and how to move forward. As I said earlier, this is a very timely uh, topic and we will see how the UK experiences and from Ibu Mashita, we will hear the programs and the policies that Indonesia has been making uh, so far in relations to the pandemic. But before we start the webinar, I'd like to give the opportunity for uh, Mr. Rahmadi Burwanto as the head of the PKN stand to give an opening remarks before we start the webinar. I'm handing over to Pak Rahmadi. Please, Pak. Okay, thank you, Chandra. Uh, Honorable Professor Stephen McGuire, yang saya hormati, Ibu Masita Kristalin, PhD. Uh, our uh, participants of this webinar, uh, first of all, I would like you to, to welcome you to our webinar on the political economy of pandemic, how to move forward. This webinar is held as one of the events in the fifth of our uh, DS Natalis, or what we call it the uh, uh, birthday of Pekanistan, which also emphasizes the Pekanistan as an academic institution that has concern and alignment on the economic in the force, both to reduce the impact and the recovery of uh, of the result of the pandemic of COVID-19. And this webinar is quite uh, important because in the last six months at least, we have seen a, a huge transformation because of this global pandemic that kept us in our homes for months and changed the pattern of our relationships with government, people in our neighborhood, and even to the other countries. Some changes that are expected to occur after the COVID-19 pandemic will raise some issues. Will countries remain closed? And how will the government carry out the national economic recovery? To find out the detailed discussion and information of these two questions, today we are very lucky that we will get a sharing experience and view from our two speakers. First is Professor Stephen McGuire, Dean of University of Sussex Business School, who will provide the UK perspective on the COVID-19 arrangements. And uh, Ibu Masita Kristalin PhD, the Special Advisor, Staff Khusus Ibu Menteri Keuangan uh, for Fiscal and Micro uh, Economic Policy Formation, uh, who will share how uh, our government overcomes the pandemic, especially through the National Economic Recovery Program, or we are uh, know, we know that as PAN. The crisis also in, 
in terms of if we try to uh, see it in the perspective of uh, optimistic view, recent opportunities. First, of course, we are now using more and more on technology everywhere. And it could uh, lead to probably questionable uh, less polarization because information can be shared uh, quickly. And a revive appreciation for outdoors or uh, life with simple pressure, outdoor activities, etc. No one knows exactly what will come, but here is our best uh, step to guide to unknowns, uh, adventure within the society, government, healthcare, economy, lifestyle, etc. that will change in the future. All in all, I'm sure that the cooperation of all parties, we can get through this crisis and make it a valuable lesson for times of COVID-19 pandemics. Lesson that re will remain important long after the time of crisis. And for you all, I, would, uh, I will say that happy webinar, happy learning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pak Rahmadi. Uh, I think it's, uh, I think uh, the, the, the statement of journey into the unknown uh, was very uh, appropriate uh, when we are dealing with the pandemic and COVID-19. What the government can do right now is setting up some policy, but still there is still unknown. And we need to go into that journey of the unknown. But yeah, as Pa Rahmadi mentions, the cooperation, how we uh, learn about the lessons from other countries sharing experiences is timely and is key on how we are uh, dealing with the pandemic and with the COVID-19. So without any further ado, I'd like to start the webinar and I'd like to first introduce two of our very distinguished speakers today. Uh, first, we have Professor Maguire. Uh, he was previously the director at the School of Management and Business at Aberystwyth University. He also taught at the University of Bath, and in 2009, he was a visiting professor of the College of Europe. He has also taught on degree and executive development program at the Audencia Nantes Management School, the University of Bath, and the Flaric Business School. His Currently, Professor of Business and Public Policy uh, in Strategy and Marketing, and also the Dean of the University of Sussex Business School. His research interests are in the areas of international political economy, international business, and corporate political activity. He has a particular interest in the interactions of firms and governments in international trade, and has published a number of papers on the World Trade Organizations. So he has also written extensively on technology policy in Europe and the United States and currently researching uh, regional trade agreements and investment flows across the Atlantic as part of a major EU Framework 7 project. I think it's very, uh, it's very lucky for us to have you here, Pa, especially with uh, COVID-19. Uh, we, we would also would like to explore later on on how the regional operations in ASEAN and how we can learn from the European Union and how the regional uh, cooperations in Europe uh, on dealing with this kind of pandemic and how we can adapt it for instance in uh, Southeast Asian setting. So very happy to have you here. Pat. The second uh, we have Ibu Mashita. Ibu Mashita Kristalin is a special advisor to the Minister of Finance in macroeconomic and fiscal policy issues. Uh, before being the special advisor to the Minister of Finance, she was an economist for the DBS Bank and also Mandiri Security, uh, Securitas. Uh, she was also an economic advisor at the Coordinating Ministry for Maritime Affairs, Republic of Indonesia uh, in 2016. Uh, before that, he, she was also an economist at the World Bank for three years, from 2014 and 2016. She's also, she was also a lecturer at the University of Indonesia and an acting lecturer at the University of La Ferning. 
she holds a Doctor of Philosophy degree in economics from Claremont Graduate University. She also holds a master's degree from the Australian National University in International Development of Economics and from Claremont Graduate University, Master of Arts in Economics, and finished uh, her Bachelor of Economics at the University of Indonesia. So I think we're very happy to have you here, Ibu uh, Mashita, to explain to us and how uh, we're moving forward on how our Indonesian, uh, how the Indonesian policies in dealing with the uh, COVID uh, and dealing with the pandemics. So for the first opportunity, uh, I would like to be, I would like to give the opportunity first to Professor Steven uh, to give your presentations and at maximum 20 minutes. I'll have a sign if there are three minutes or five minutes left uh, on your presentations. And for those who are watching from Zoom and for those who are watching on YouTube, if you have a questions, you can uh, put your question up in the YouTube chat or you can also put your question up on the Zoom chat and I'll invent, uh, I'll list that down and I'll ask that to Professor Steven and Ibu Mashita later on and the question and answer sessions. But I think we'll also have the, we will have the opportunity for those on Zoom in here to ask directly to Professor Steven and Ibu Mashita. So on the first opportunity, without further ado, I'm handing over to you, Prof. Steven. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chandra. It's, uh, it's wonderful to see you all. Good, good morning or good afternoon, as the case may be. Uh, let me offer my thanks to uh, Pramadi Merwanto for uh, organizing and uh, this seminar and Chandra for moderating. Um, I wasn't able to visit Indonesia a few months ago. Uh, I hope this is some uh, way to make up for that. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you all in due course. Let me just share my screen now uh, for my presentation. So good morning, everybody. Um, I've been asked to talk about COVID-19 and, uh, and its impact on uh, the British economy. So I'll do that in the next few minutes. This is what I plan to talk about to you, a little um, tour of the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes. I'm gonna talk ever so quickly about the situation pre-COVID uh, and then talk about the various job protection measures that were put in place. Uh, the monetary policies that were put in place by the British government in the past few months, uh, some of the various in, varied impacts that those policies have had, uh, and then some speculation, I suppose, on uh, the short-term uh, horizon over the next uh, few months and to one or two years. So the UK went into the crisis with an uncertain but generally positive economic situation. Uh, economic indicators had been weakening slightly, but one big uh, advantage was that employment was at a record high, with employment somewhere around 4%. The economy had been uh, working really at effectively full employment for quite some time. Government borrowing was declining after a very, very steep increase in borrowing during the 2008 economic crisis. Um, and that allowed uh, we almost can't remember it now, but that allowed the then new government in, uh, in January, the newly elected Conservative government, to be reasonably generous and optimistic uh, in the first uh, Chancellor's statement made uh, early in 2020. Um, Brexit, of course, had been, had been done by then in the sense that we had formally left the European Union, um, but uh, nobody at the time was really thinking that the uh, trade agreement was going to be anything other than uh, reasonably easy to get. That was the government's view, uh, not necessarily shared. So pre-COVID, somewhat weakening economic growth, but generally stable. And I, I'm using this little um, graph from the Office for National Statistics really to show you uh, that if you look at uh, toward the right-hand side, you'll see 2016 was the referendum referendum. And I think one of the things that really sort of damaged the case made by Remain, uh, the people who wished to remain in the EU, was they had predicted, of course, that the sky would fall. Um, and as you can see, it never really did. 
uh, growth be, was a bit choppier, perhaps, uh, and there are some impacts on investment. Um, but the sky didn't fall. Uh, it took the it took the virus really to uh, uh, damage the UK economy in the way that you see over on the left there in 2008, the financial crisis, which had a major impact uh, on the UK economy and on UK society. So. Once the crisis was, was underway, the, the COVID-19 crisis, and the UK, of course, locked down uh, in late March, uh, and there is a debate uh, amongst individuals about whether we locked down too early or not. Uh, it's nonetheless the case that the UK is, is quite exposed because Heathrow is one of the world's largest, if not the world's largest international hub. So anyway, we locked down in late January, and quite quickly, the government came up with the job retention scheme, the coronavirus job retention scheme, which is effectively a furlough scheme, uh, where the government pays 80% of an employee's wages uh, up to 2,500 pounds per month. Uh, and the furlough program now covers 8.4 million uh, individuals. Uh, it is regarded, I think, rightly as one of the success stories of the government's uh, program. It was rolled out reasonably quickly um, and um, some firms um, have taken advantage, others have not, um, but it's a centerpiece of it. And then there was further support for the self-employed uh, and an enhanced sort of debt advice service for firms that were suffering immediate cash flow or financing difficulties. As a result of this, there's been thus far little observable impact on employment rates. I'll, I'll show you later the claimant count, which is now beginning to climb. But at the minute, we haven't seen unemployment by our normal count uh, increasing much above 4%. So people are being kept on, they're being kept off the formal unemployment statistics. What has really cut back is hours worked. Uh, and we know that from um, survey data and vacancy rates, of course, have fallen significantly. There, there is, and this will have an important knock-on effect. There is very, very little economic activity such that people are advertising for new posts. Crucially also, household perceptions of job security have deteriorated at a record rate. Uh, the market survey, uh, which I cite there from May, um, has taken 50% in this survey is neutral uh, and it's deteriorated to minus 35 uh, in the most recent survey. So this of course raises concerns that even after the virus, households will be so concerned about their finances, they won't spend. And that, of course, raises its own problems. Here's some more data on the furlough scheme. Uh, I've mentioned the 8.4 million uh, workers. Uh, around almost a million firms of various sizes have taken advantage of the scheme. Uh, the estimated cost through May was about 10.1 billion, but that's after of course, that doesn't quite get the steady state characteristic now. The, the scheme is now expected to cost somewhere between eight to 11 billion pounds per month, um, which is slightly cheaper than expected. Um, we're not quite sure why. We think it's partly because large employers have to some extent been um, uh, shamed um, by public, uh, um, public attention on whether large firms or, or some interesting firms like fashion firms should ever be furloughing uh, people. So we've seen some firms furlough staff only to find them brought back off furlough because of public perception that you really shouldn't be reliant on this scheme. There are um, firms owned by you know millionaires, billionaires, entrepreneurs, and the view is these people should be able to tide workers over without resort to the government scheme. From August, the scheme tapers anyway, and the government is now confronting. So it's extended the scheme through October, but the terms change and they become less generous really from the next few weeks. And there is a view that this may, of course, catalyze subsequent job losses. On uh, the financial side, uh, that is what the Bank of England did on various monetary measures. First, there was an emergency cut in the interest rate, not 0.1%. Uh, and then there's what's called a term funding scheme, which is essentially offering uh, qualifying firms um, long-term debt uh, at that particular interest rate. 
Um, there's also a lending facility which is designed to address cash flow. Uh, this particular scheme has attracted some criticism because the requirements are that um, your cash flow, you should not have had to report any financial difficulties in the preceding several months. So in other words, they should be sound businesses. Um, and the view is that's actually left out a number of companies that are generally actually sound, but were nonetheless encountering difficulties even pre-COVID. So there is some controversy around eligibility for that. And crucially, what we've seen is the government just generally relaxing capital and lending requirements for banks. Uh, this has resulted uh, in the past few weeks of an expansion of, of bank lending uh, to various companies of around 190 billion pounds. And the government, or excuse me, the Bank of England continues with its quantitative easing program. Uh, and it expects to expend about uh, almost 800 billion by the end of uh, 2020 on this. It's announced, in fact, in the past few days, further uh, quantitative easing to the tune of about 100 billion pounds. So there's been a substantial injection of liquidity into the UK uh, economy. That hasn't stopped, as I said, recently, just very recently, the claimant count has begun to uh, soar. We think this is a combination of, I've said not many people are actually being made redundant. They're not actually being laid off. This is a result of workers who were temporary anyway, uh, some new to the job market, uh, and contingent or insecure workers now coming on to the, the, the claimant role. So they are climbing uh, very, very steeply. So we can expect that that will add to the cost uh, in uh, the next few weeks. I thought I'd give you a, this is from uh, the ONS, the Office for National Statistics. This gives you some idea of how the furlough scheme versus continuing uh, remote working has worked through various sectors of the economy. Uh, what you'll notice if I start at the bottom is the, the sectors that have made most extensive use of the furlough scheme are, are ones you actually would expect. Uh, accommodation and food service, so the tourism industry, arts and entertainment, both are sectors that rely very heavily on hourly paid uh, labor, uh, contingent labor, seasonal workers, lots have been put on, on, on furlough. Uh, relatively few are able to work from home by, by definition. Um, by contrast, if you look at the upper part of the graph and you see in red, um, there's a very clear education, professional, administrative stratification of this. Uh, the education sector, including universities, by and large, there have been no uh, layoffs, no redundancies. People are working from home very effectively. Um, and that's true in inform ICT, information technologies, and well, pretty much are what we would call, what we used to call our white collar workforce has generally been able to work from home and to work remotely uh, without many uh, job losses at all. And so that gives you some indication of where this is, this is falling. And of course, that raises a distributional question when we come out of lockdown, is are the job losses going to fall disproportionately on those group of people down toward the bottom of that graph there, that, that figure there, uh, who, were, who are among the most vulnerable anyway? This gives you some indication of the, again, this is ONS data. This gives you some indication of the resilience and why the government is very keen to end the lockdown as soon as we can. This gives you some indication of the cash position, again, across various sectors in the economy. And you'll see the, the bar that's most important, really, is the red bar. That's the number of this survey would have been done in April or May. Um, and what you can see is across the economy, Lots and lots of companies are going to run out of cash in the next few months. Uh, and there is a real view. Uh, you sense it from government. It's not so much articulated, but you just sense it in the way that they're configuring programs. They really do want to get this economy back up and running by the autumn and into December because a lot of companies simply cannot trade into 2021. Uh, with these current lockdown conditions. As you can see, the bulk of the accommodation and tourist industry uh, will not have the cash reserves to survive this uh, much longer. So I'll talk ever so quickly about the impacts. Um, the COVID response has been massive. It's equivalent to about 
12% of UK GDP. I haven't mentioned all of the programs. They, uh, a full list of the programs uh, goes on for quite some, some ways. But broadly speaking, all the programs are designed to do one or both of these two things. First, avoid mass unemployment. Avoid a situation where firms are making literally thousands of people redundant at once. So that's the centerpiece of the furlough scheme. But it's also the reason why lots of small businesses have been given support, um, given money, given access to debt that they would not otherwise have, have gotten. Really to address the unemployment, but similarly to address their cash flow difficulties. The same I would add is with the university sector. The, uh, the measures that have been announced for the university sector are exactly in a, in, with the same intention as for those of private businesses. Address cash flow um, by giving you liquidity early on to manage cash flow issues for the next few months. Nonetheless, in April, the economy contracted by 20%. Uh, having fallen only 5% in March. Um, I will have to say there's a lot of debate around the confidence of these figures, so we will see. And there's some indications that retail sales in the past few days have been better than expected. There is some concern that the job retention schemes uh, don't cover significant parts of the economy. I have to say it's been it's proved very difficult for some charities, for example, who aren't in the private sector the public sector proper is not eligible for furlough. So not-for-profits, some elements of, again, university and education are caught by this. Um, it's not clear whether they can take full advantage of the furlough scheme. There is no mechanism uh, to accommodate new entrants into the workforce. And these are the thousands of graduating high school and university students, some people just who might want to wish, who in other circumstances would have come back to work uh, perhaps after having children or whatever. There's no mechanism at the minute to help those people back into it, uh, back into the workforce. To be fair to the government, the measures really can't address and weren't designed to address uh, demand weakness. This was about uh, dealing with the sh initial shock to the economy um, and just preserving jobs and preserving as much cash as possible. The measures weren't designed uh, to deal with the long-term uh, curtailment of demand uh, going forward. So the immediate future, the next few months, literally, I think we'll, I'll, I'll talk about it. August, really, September, October, really through December. The first is that we have to unwind the furlough scheme. Everybody understands this, but there will be a concern that we will just catalyze lots of job losses. And that for, actually, from it's from really September, uh, that we will see a significant number of jobs being lost. And so there is some talk now is beginning to turn to how we get demand back into the economy. There are extraordinary worries about household spending. Um, I didn't give you our savings rates, uh, but again, household, spend, household savings rates have soared um, across the spectrum, actually. Um, as fearful consumers uh, stop buying. We don't know whether these initial figures on retail sales just indicate a sharp pent up demand, a burst of buying activity in the last few days. That's then gonna be followed by a longer term lull. And we've really got no data at the moment on purchases of, of, of larger goods, um, household appliances, cars, and those sorts of things. Uh, Brexit is, has come back to inform this, of course, inform these concerns that um, I say the talks with the EU are not going well. Um, I mean, I think we will still get something, uh, I have to say, I mean, there is, the, there is the goodwill. The EU needs, the EU doesn't need any more uncertainty either. Uh, if we can agree some sort of bare bones free trade deal, I think that will still happen by December. Um, but at the minute, it's not proving as easy as I think either side expected. I mentioned schools. Uh, this is emerging as a major social issue. It's well known that, that absences from schooling, whether because of in, industrial action strikes by teachers or long-term illness, has very serious consequences for children. And uh, so there's that concern that the government hasn't paid enough attention to the social side of this, particularly schools. It will also be necessary to get schools back up and running so that you can release parents back into the workforce. Because at the moment, you could encourage firms to open up, 
but a lot of two income families will need to put their kids back into school to get that done. That's, those are the references I've used if you're interested in picking them up. Um, and with that, I'll just thank you very much, Chandra, and head back to you. And uh, I look forward to uh, Mashita's uh, comments. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Stephen. I think that was a very uh, insightful presentation and how uh, we are seeing the, <clears throat> the conditions in the UK. I noted the furlough schemes and how it affects the UK economy as a whole but 12% of the UK GDP has been allocated for tackling down the pandemic or the COVID, and that's nice to hear. Uh, particularly, I'm also uh, interested in how the talk with the EU uh, is not going well. Well, maybe we can talk about that and elaborate more on that, on how the regional uh, arrangements in the European Union, especially on the Brexit later on the discussion sessions. But right now, I'd like to give the opportunity to Ibu Masita to uh, present uh, about the Indonesian and how the policies in Indonesia regarding the pandemic of COVID-19. Handing over to you, Ibu. Terima kasih, Pak Chandra. Uh, thank you, Professor Stephen, for a very nice presentation. Uh, can I have my slides up, please? Uh, thank you for the opportunity, and it's really nice to hear from Professor Stephen on how the UK has managed the unprecedented situation. Uh, I would start by going directly to slide four, please. So basically, I would like to start by, you know, uh, reminding everyone here that during the start of the year, especially for emerging economy, fourth, uh, fourth quarter of last year, in fact, there's a huge rally of capital flows coming into emerging market. And that still happened until around first week of February. And COVID has already happened in Wuhan since December, right? In January, February, rupiah is one of the highest appreciating currencies in the emerging market space, especially the one with, uh, with the you know, high current account deficit, high yield, like India, Indonesia, Brazil. And then the WHO just declared the pandemic on the 12th of March. And the capital uh, flow is still on, on, on rally at that time. In fact, capital flow uh, realized it a week later where it suddenly jumped to a record low in March 20. Uh, and then uh, by that time, all of the economic indicators has went down significantly. Uh, one of the volatility indicators such as FIX uh, was the highest uh, ever since that uh, measures was created. Uh, all of the emerging market currencies were depreciated uh, by a significant amount and a lot of capital outflow coming out of emerging economies. Uh, next slide, please. So for Indonesia, uh, you know, uh, similar with other countries that it, the COVID actually uh, problem started from health and then becoming a social because of the social distancing, economy and then finance, uh, finance, right? Uh, six, this is just explaining that you know, the, the chart for many countries are still increasing, uh, including Indonesia. Next. I would like to talk more about, you know, GDP forecasts around the world because Indonesia's GDP are mainly also affected by international trade and, you know, we're, we're also involved in the supply chain in Asia. So the downgrade of global growth forecast will also affect Indonesia's uh, growth forecast eventually. Uh, as we see that many international organization has revised down uh, many of the projected uh, forecasts before. Uh, but interestingly that everyone are still optimistic in having a V-shaped recovery, meaning that 2020 growth uh, went down significantly and then start improving in 2021, which is might be and might not be the case uh, given you know the nature of the pandemic if we uh, compare the current pandemic with the spanish flu for example the second wave that happened then 
was actually a lot higher. The peak is a lot higher than the first wave. So we're not hoping this to happen again, but that uh, we cannot also uh, eliminate that possibility, which is why the government of Indonesia is saving some of the fiscal space uh, to be able to react more should you know, more deter deterioration in growth uh, come in the near future. Uh, next slide, please. Um, our current fiscal deficit number is at 6.34%. Uh, it's uh, very low compared to, for example, our neighboring country, Malaysia and Singapore, almost 20% and also the UK that uh, Professor just mentioned. Uh, next, but the the COVID case in Indonesia are still on a increasing mode, and in fact, uh, some uh, worries about the the possibility of having a, a second wave. Uh, but the government is working on you know a lot of socialization in terms of the new COVID protocol, because if the the Indonesia economy are uh, mostly consists of uh, small medium enterprise around 70 and 97 percent of total uh, entity was you know can be categorized as small medium enterprise uh, small medium enterprise also account 60 percent of Indonesia GDP and more than 90 percent of employment both formal and non-formal so the close down of the economy with less economic activity, of course, will impact Indonesia's growth uh, significantly. In fact, if we compare to the last two crises, 2008 and also the Asian financial crisis in 97, uh, on these two crises, the small medium enterprise and informal sectors were in fact playing a role as a shock absorber to the economy because it was financial crisis. So sectors that are affected are sectors that depends on financial uh, sectors uh, on the funding side, right? But the informal sectors are less dependent on the financial sector and hence become a shock absorber of the economy. But the current uh, uh, incident was a bit different. Uh, because now uh, the informal sectors and small medium enterprise are the most hit and the first that get hit once uh, there was a uh, physical distancing and working from home, etc. Next. Uh, if we're looking at Indonesia growth, uh, Indonesia growth has uh, contracted significantly. It seems high compared to other countries that already in the high negative in the first quarter. It's still 3% uh, year on year. However, Indonesia's potential growth is around 5%. So it's, uh, it's a quite a significant drop in terms of growth rate. And the second part is that uh, the physical distancing actually only happened in Indonesia starting week, third week of March. So the, the, so the impact of this physical distancing on only two weeks of the overall quarter affect almost half of the, uh, uh, the potential growth level. So we think that growth is going to, uh, to contract um, significantly in the second quarter because in the second quarter, Indonesia has imposed uh, strict uh, physical distancing and stay at home uh, measures for majors, uh, for major provinces like DKI, East Java, West Java, and Central Java. In terms of the sectoral level, uh, if if we're looking at Indonesia's economic structure, right, uh, the big the biggest three sector, which is agriculture, uh, manufacturing, and then services, and uh, a lot of the services are low value added services sectors, account for more than sixty percent. Only three sectors account for more than sixty percent of Indonesia employment. So these sectors is also uh, hit by the current condition, especially the manufacturing and some services, uh, especially with relates to leisure, restaurant, hotel, etc. So this must impact Indonesia's uh, income uh, for for majority of the people uh, significantly. Unfortunately, we don't have a biweekly survey for unemployment or underemployment. 
uh, data, but we can see from retail survey that uh, you know this underemployment is also quite significantly happened in Indonesia, which is why the first and the biggest priority for that fiscal uh, widening is directed toward uh, additional social safety net in order to help Indonesian to cope with the current income deterioration. Next. So if we're looking at growth, uh, um, we have like a scenario <clears throat> for very severe and severe for this year. Actually, we are leaning towards more very severe scenario at this moment. So we are not seeing that uh, overall growth this year could be 2.3. Uh, it could be less than one uh, or even uh, negative for overall year with significant additional poverty and unemployment. So Indonesian poverty rate for the last four years have actually declined uh, quite significantly and also inequality has improved. Um, however, I think it's everywhere the, the COVID crisis will, will increase it back again. The unemployment uh, increased by, we estimated if, if we hit the very severe scenario, will increase by 5.2 million uh, people. So this is this is very significant. Next uh, slide, fourteen, please. So what is the focus of the government now? Uh, hold on. Um, so the priority of Indonesian government currently is on basically three major areas. First is the health sectors. Of course, if you don't control the pandemic, then the recovery will be uh, will be stalled, right? Because even the recovery trajectory now, everybody is still uh, you know thinking about a V-shaped recovery, but it could be an L shape. While recovery takes more than two three years, right? Or even a W, uh, where, where some people suggest where uh, if there is a second or third waves of the uh, the peak of the pandemic. Uh, so that's the first priority. The second priority is support to consumption or uh, improve social safety net. Uh, Indonesia's poverty rate last year before COVID was at 9%, right? And our social safety net cover until the bottom 30%. So actually Indonesia's social safety net is already way above poverty. It, it already includes the vulnerable. However, given the current condition, even though we don't have uh, a, a biweekly uh, unemployment survey, but from companies' reports, we understand that this uh, also happens to the upper uh, decile of the society, right? So uh, layoffs and underemployment, work from home that, uh, that uh, make uh, incomes went down, uh, also affecting people at decile four, five, even to decile six. So the current social safety net was widened from only covering up to decile three to decile six. And the amount of uh, the coverage is also increased uh, to people already covered in the decile three uh, from zero to decile three. And then we have additional social safety net from decile three to decile six. Uh, and then the last priority, of course, is the business sectors. Uh, many people have, you know, questions everywhere whether you are up for the economy or for the human, right? Uh, as the government, of course, uh, it's actually the same thing. It's just a different side of the coin. Because if you want to save uh, the human from, you know, experiencing this unprecedented situation, not only the health part, the social safety net part, but also have to ensure that people have you know uh, income flowing in and job will be available for them when uh, the the situation is getting better so the third priority of the government is helping the business sectors but more on the defensive uh, scenario base helping them not to lay off workers and not too much uh, helping in the working capital uh, on area where this physical distancing really impact the demand for that particular sector. For example, for the services, uh, trading services sectors and retails, 
they they don't really need additional working capital. They just need uh, additional liquidity to help them pay some of the debt. For example, we do a lot of debt restructuring as well with the economic recovery program. However, uh, it's unlikely that they need additional working capital. But for manufacturing that is still ongoing, for example, the treatment could be different. They can get uh, on top of the restructuring of their loan, they can also get the working capital help from the government. Next slide, please. Uh, so um, I just discussed the fiscal side of the policy. Uh, actually, monetary policy and also banking supervision policy has also helped. Uh, we did a lot of monetary easing, BI, not only reducing the BI uh, re reverse repo rate, which is our policy rate, but also you know, increasing intervention in the bonds market, in the currency market, and also expanding liquidity to the banking sectors. Currently, Indonesia's banking sector's liquidity are relatively safe, meaning that you know people with a higher income, they tend to save because it's more volatile situation. And then banks are more cautious in uh, let, uh, increasing credits, right? Because of, you know, you don't know when the economy will start to, uh, to be active again. So in terms of liquidity of the banking sectors until this point, assuming still a V-shaped recovery, will not be a huge issue for Indonesia. The issue is liquidity at the corporate level because corporates still have, uh, uh, you know, have to pay loans, have to pay some of the costs that are recurring, but they don't have enough uh, revenue stream coming in. Uh, next, please. I think I'll go over uh, directly to slide number 22. Yeah, so overall economic recovery program for Indonesia, this is outside of the health uh, sectors, which are also priority, but I don't discuss now, uh, is uh, supporting the demand side, mm, like I mentioned, social protection, and then we even give electricity, additional electricity subsidies. And then on the supply side, we have a lot of uh, measures like interest rate subsidies uh, and then re loan restructuring, working capital, etc. Uh, on the supply side, we are still, you know, uh, learning and looking for more avenue to help the business sectors to survive this condition. Uh, but for people who aren't familiar with Indonesia's economy prior to COVID, so we are actually in the middle of economic reform. Indonesia aspires to escape the middle income trap by 2045, uh, 100 years of Indonesia independence. Uh, and then to be able to do that, you know, you have to increase potential growth and increasing potential growth requires uh, structural reform, such as we are currently doing a lot of uh, reform at the same time, infrastructure, logistics costs that are the two main issues of Indonesia, improving revenue, uh, government revenue, capability, and all these structural issues are need to be addressed as well. Uh, and Indonesia's growth is already around its potential at 5%, need to grow a lot faster than that to be able to uh, escape the middle income trap, of course, by 2045. Now, we are still experiencing a demographic dividend which, you know, if we combine with good human capital and higher value added, uh, then it's supposed to be able to boost growth. Mm, everything is underway and then COVID happens, right? So now the strategy changed a bit. Now the, the focus is more on saving the short run situation, at least to make the economy, uh, you know, uh, healthy enough by the time uh, COVID uh, issue subsides. Uh, and then we will continue with the economic reform uh, after that. Uh, in fact, some of the subsidy reform we are thinking to do because now, you know, oil price has gone down. Uh, it's uh, It could be the time to do some of the reform. But of course, now the priority is very short term to help, uh, you know, Indonesian to overcome the situation. And hopefully next year, when uh, the situation is getting better and hopefully vaccine uh, is already out there, then we're hoping the recovery will take at least another two years to go back to Indonesia's previous level. 
uh, I think that's all from me. Uh, let's discuss in the Q and A session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bu Mas uh, Masita. That's an excellent for the excellent presentations. I think uh, we noted <clears throat> a very important message that health and safety net uh, is still a uh, the very priority for Indonesia uh, to overcome the pandemic of COVID-19 and how our government uh, focus on rebuilding the small and medium enterprises as the most hit. And this is what makes it different from the previous crisis that we've been through uh, as the small and medium enterprises is the most hit in the pandemic. And the government is trying to focus also on the small and medium enterprises empowerment to overcome the pandemic of COVID-19. So uh, I'd like to check if there are any uh, would like to raise the questions directly. Uh, we do have several questions already in here uh, for uh, Professor Stevens and also for uh, Ibu Masita. Uh, we can just start the questions and answers. Uh, I'd like to first to Professor Stephen, uh, that there is a question on how do you think, this is how is your view, what is your opinions on the Indonesian? How, how do you think the recent changes introduced recently would sufficient to help the uh, small and medium enterprises in Indonesia? So what is your take? on focusing on the small and medium enterprises uh, for uh, in Indonesia as a focus to overcome for the pandemic uh, of COVID-19. I'll start with Professor Stephen first to answer that question. So thank you very much, Chandra. Um, I was struck in the presentation how similar some of the policy responses were um, in, in, in spite of the differences in the economy. So. Um, manufacturing is a much smaller component of UK GDP. I mean, we're about 85% services. If you, on, on the most heroic definition of manufacturing, you get to around 13% of manufacturing for the UK. It's probably more like 10. Um, so it, it struck me that we're trying to do the same things uh, to some extent. Um, secure jobs, uh, secure cash flow. I don't know the Indonesian economy in depth, but uh, so I, I, I would note the similarities. Um, I suspect you also have a difficulty. We are very different countries geographically, and I and I think geography matters in this in this case. You are dealing with a much larger, much more populous country than we are, uh, with attendant logistical issues that, that that we actually don't don't need to deal with, being one of the smallest and most densely populated countries. Um, in Europe. So I'm struck by the similarity. I hope they both work. I think it will be very difficult. I'd, I'd note, actually, I'd note one thing in the UK, and I don't know if, if you see it in Indonesia. Um, I observe on the, uh, amongst a lot of British consumers, a real effort. People are making an effort to s support small businesses. They're making an effort to buy from local shops. They are making an effort uh, to support the local baker or what, whatever. Uh, and I don't know if you see that dynamic here, but I certainly observe it and I see it with people. They're going out of their way to try and be supportive um, and support the local tradesmen when they can. So let's hope they are effective. I really can't answer the question specifically, but I just do know I'm struck by how similar our policy responses are. Thank you, uh, Prof. Steven. Uh, Ibu Mashita, there's a question from uh, the participants uh, from <clears throat> to specifically to Ibu Mashita. How does the Ministry of Finance forecast about economic growth that will reach minus 3.8% in the second quarter? But today, the BPS or the Indonesian Statistical Agency predicted that in the second quarter of Indonesian economic growth will be minus 7%. How do you think, how big is the fiscal deficit will hit the economic growth in Indonesia? And what will be like the priorities for the governments for the next year, for instance, in after 2020, uh, 2021 and 22, what will be our priorities for 
the next two or three years after the uh, 2020. Thank you. So uh, forecasting growth is very, very difficult at this time uh, of the, so true, yeah. you know, because of the situation, yeah. Uh, which is why a lot of international organizations frequently also revise the global growth and revise the country growth uh, assumption. But for government, uh, we cannot say, oh, it's hard to forecast, then we don't forecast. So what we're doing is that we look at the data and the high frequency indicators and we create the best case and the worst case scenario. Of course, we don't announce this, right? So the range are around that area where you have a significant uh, contraction. Uh, we're seeing at minus 3.8%. Could be higher, for example, if apparently the impact of this physical distancing and stay at home uh, policies uh, impact uh, to pol uh, to consumption is higher than we expect, right? There's a lot of uh, a lot of possibilities here. And second, with a lot of informal sectors which are not captured even in the taxation data, so uh, these sectors cannot really be measured in terms of you know the the high frequency data that are available. So a lot of uh, a lot of um, you know stand big, bigger standard deviation in 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 projecting growth. So how will that affect fiscal deficit? Of course, as a, as a percent of GDP, that will affect directly, right? If GDP goes down, uh, fiscal deficit as percent of GDP, of course, will widen. That, that number one. Number two is uh, by design, because the government, when the growth is lower than expected, will expect to you know, hit, give more stimulus, right? And Indonesia, uh, Professor Stephen, we have a 3% uh, fiscal deficit uh, maximum by law. But given this COVID, uh, you know, COVID situation, the government has enacted another law, temporary law, to loosen the fiscal deficit uh, criteria uh, until 2022, right? So we have three years uh, without the limit for fiscal deficit. Of course, even though the law doesn't limit our fiscal deficit, there's a limit to it. What is the limit to fiscal deficit? Is our ability to repay, right? Because, you know, even until now, we're still paying our debt from the Asian financial crisis. The government is still paying that debt until, even until today. So any decision in expanding the fiscal deficit will have consequences, not just for this year, but we'll have longer consequences uh, because of the you know, government bonds uh, range to 20, 50 years. So the government is taking this seriously, thinking you know, what is the optimal level given the situation. Of course, when the situation worsens, then fiscal deficit could widen again. And if the situation is improving, then fiscal deficit can uh, narrow again. Yeah. Priority for the next two or three years. This is also not an easy uh, question because if there's no COVID, then obviously the structural reform in order to increase our potential growth is the government priority. Now the priority, of course, is to recover from the current condition uh, and then to help the people to overcome this uh, bo both on the health part and also on the income part. Uh, but also at the same time, still managing to have a balanced uh, macroeconomic stability because this is also important because sustainability of fiscal policy is important because it, uh, it will depend, uh, it, it will affect, you know, uh, whether the government could repay their loans and how the investor perceive Indonesia government's bonds, for example, and then how we can increase our revenue collection so that we can, you know, at least with the widening fiscal deficit, the, the increase of the government loan is not as big if you have higher revenue. But of course, you cannot really depend on revenue when you have higher growth. So many things um, are on the table right now. So we're, we're trying to, you know, fine tune everything because, even, as I said, even though you don't have a, a cap for fiscal deficit, the cap is our own ability to repay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Ibu, for the explanation. Uh, I, if I might go back to Professor Stephen, uh, we do here have a question from 
uh, Mr. Joko Siswanto. Uh, the question is, how is this COVID-19 pandemic affecting the Brexit talk with EU thing? So I think uh, you mentioned in your presentations earlier, right? Uh, how uh, it affects the EU and how it's not going well with the EU. Can you like elaborate more on how it affects the Brexit talks? Sure, I can. Um, I think the principal uh, impact of COVID has just been government attention. Uh, without COVID, uh, this would have been one of the uh, major focal points of the government's attention the last few months, and there would have been much larger teams assigned to it and all that. Boris Johnson, of course, as you know, was infected by COVID and if reports are to be believed, was gravely ill for a period, as were a number of his ministerial team and his ministerial advisors. So the, the, the one answer is the virus has very effectively and quite literally damaged government uh, decision making and attention on this. Um, there is a view, of course, too, that this is helpful uh, if you're if you're quite cynical about these things, because, of course, it's going to be impossible to when we from January 2021, no one's going to know whether the economic damage was caused by COVID or or the failure of the Brexit talks. It's all going to be and Brexit in the context of things will be almost a rounding error. Um, if, if COVID turns out to be as bad. Um, so I think there's a basic issue of, of, of bandwidth. Though the other interesting thing that I think is affecting the talks is this move you've seen globally toward greater security around supply chains. Uh, I think lots of countries have been concerned about our, our reliance on imported medicines, imported medical equipment, and the UK and the EU for that matter, I mean the EU has just issued a new directive several weeks ago about this, uh, a much more stringent view around uh, reshoring supply chains and key technologies and key products. And I think that is going to affect and is affecting actually Brexit talks around subsidies, R&D programs, this level playing field, which we used to think of largely in terms of environmental compliance. But we'll have a factor now as we, as we move to a world where we, we, we think more in, um, autarchical economic terms, this will affect the, the, the talks. So I think COVID has had a damaging effect in terms of attention span by government, but it's also really affected views around uh, global supply chains. Thank you, Prof. Uh, before we move on to another uh, questions, I think quite, there's quite a few questions and I think it is great that we do have uh, I think uh, for another 45 minutes just to answer the questions. But before that, I'd like to invite uh, if there are any participants on the Zoom that would like to talk directly and deliver their questions directly, you can just raise your hand and we'll, we'll unmute you to, for you to deliver your questions. Um, I'll get back to Ibu Mashita, if I may. Uh, since we're talking about regional, uh, the EU, the Brexit, and how we're tackling the pandemic, how do you rate the importance of the regional corporations, do you think, uh, in tackling the COVID-19, especially among the Southeast Asia and East Asia countries? Uh, how do you, is there any like significant, uh, uh, significant effort, significant initiative in the regions that will help together the regions to overcome the pandemic or the COVID-19. And this also goes to the questions later on to Professor Stephen uh, on actually how is that, what is the regional initiatives like in the EU, in the uh, UK and other countries on tackling together the pandemic and how important is it in terms of uh, getting uh, or tackling together the pandemic? Uh, and I'd like to hear from Ibu Masita first. Thank you, Pak. Um, so in the region, I guess, um, you know, you would need some kind of uh, a standing facility to help countries uh, with liquidity issues to repay their loans, uh, both to investors and also to multilateral organization. IMF, of course, have helped a lot of the leaks, the low income countries that doesn't have market access. Uh, but if, you know, if COVID prolong uh, to next year, for example, 
then some of the emerging economies that are still can withdraw funds from the global investors yeah. might might be strained as well right and at that particular time you would need a more concerted international effort uh, to help uh, liquidity globally otherwise we'll fall together that's that's one part second part i think that would be very useful and indonesia is actually already part of it is you know the vaccine uh, creation right mm -hmm. i think this this happens not just uh in the region it happens globally uh that you know many countries that are more advanced in the in the vaccines creation right now is also helping other countries to share some of the results uh, some of the vaccines to do uh to do the protocol together um and i think that's a good initiative because uh without the vaccines uh it's hard to imagine a, a fast recovery for the whole economy and i think it would be good if this is done by international cooperation another thing that i uh realize is you know every time uh, something like this happens usually there's movement towards more protectionism right uh, because people are worried about their own safety in terms of energy or food and uh, it's like some already talks about import substitution we need to be really really careful though because many countries has realized a lot of asia supply chain has depend too much on china so now a lot of a lot of people a lot of countries including the us trying to you know at least diversify the supply chain sources to different countries right but this is also similar with countries who only want to depend on their own domestic production it's the same like depending with china right you cannot depend on one source you need to yeah. diversify so i think it's a very dangerous move uh, towards that direction although you know with the us and china strain in terms of trade wars it's already started but I think in, in Asia, uh, with the massive supply chain situation, uh, it's more or less easier to diversify. The issue is that whether each country could take the opportunity in Indonesia is one of the countries that, you know, are want to take this opportunity to have these uh, uh, companies that are relocating out of China, for example, uh, to move to other parts of Asia. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you so, so much Ibu, for the uh, answer. If I may now uh, uh, move to Professor Stevens on how do you see this regional cooperations? And while Ibu Masita also mentions the protectionism and how we have to be careful with the protectionisms, uh, if you can also just uh, explain on how the, since we're talking about political economy, how the protectionism process like free market thinkers or inter inter interventionists would be in the future regarding after or post the pandemic of COVID-19, Prof. Stephen. Sure, thank you. Um, <clears throat> UK policy, UK policy is, is sort of um, divided at the moment. <clears throat> On the one hand, post-Brexit, there's a very, very strong preference by the government to conclude lots of free trade agreements relatively quickly. I mean, there's a commitment to get about 80% of our exports covered by FTAs mm. inside of three years. Now, one assumes that includes an EU agreement, but also agreements uh, with New Zealand, Australia, Canada, the US. You might know, of course, uh, we've made a formal application to join CPTPP, mm. um, which I think I think months ago would have been seen as absolutely bizarre and still might be viewed as absolutely bizarre. But I, I think weirdly, given where we are now with these global supply chains and a, our reliance on Asia, and I, I take the point Masita's made about a lot of us have become, have been surprised and concerned about our reliance on China. Uh, that this may actually be more of an opportunity than we, than we thought. So I, I, it's, I'm just interested that what was considered absurd a few months ago is now being thought of as, you know, that's not a bad idea. I'll say one other thing, though. The UK government is also committed to a much more aggressive industrial and technology policy. Whether we can afford it after COVID is a separate matter. But going into the uh, COVID crisis, the government has 
was committed, very, very strongly committed to a significant increase in R&D spending, um, include, and not least, and in fact, major, in major areas around green technologies of all sorts. Um, universities were pretty, we were pretty happy with the direction of government travel. Those two things sit at some tension with each other, right? Because you'll have one department of government that's very keen on a range of industrial subsidies, um, mindful of WTO regulation around that. And we have this commitment to a, a FTA. So I think the UK will remain, I think, a very good global citizen post-Brexit. Um, and I think the path will be a bit different than we might have expected. But I think there will be a, the UK will want to reestablish multilateralism because we will need it now that we don't have membership of the EU. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Stephen. Well, uh, since we're on that topic, uh, we do have another participant asking it to Ibu Masita uh, related to the free trade agreements that we've been discussed just now. Uh, on how relevant is or are the free trade uh, free trade agreements being discussed with several countries to boost our good exports amidst this pandemic? I mean, how important now the free trade agreement discussions in our efforts to overcome the pandemic? I think. I think it doesn't hurt to do it simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Because now Indonesia's uh, trade balance has sort of improved, but it's more because of the deterioration of imports bigger than the deterioration of exports. So both go down, but import go down by more. So that's not that's not a uh, an entirely good reason, right? To to have a, a improvement in the trade balance. So I think uh, improving uh, export competitiveness is key for Indonesia right now. Uh, but of course, now all the efforts and the government funding um, are actually reallocated into the COVID uh, COVID uh, situation. Yeah. Yeah, and then we kind of cut budget on less priority and then for several projects, uh, infrastructure projects and some projects to support industries are, are extended, meaning that if it's supposed to be done in three years, we extend it to five years to lower the fiscal burden for uh, each year, right? So given the, the limit, of course, we need to play the right balance between this long-term goal of, you know, uh, competitiveness, uh, improving competitiveness, and the short-term goal of solving these issues right here, right now. Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, I think, yeah, that's the the right, yeah, the right thing, Ibu. Yeah, I share the same, the same view as Ibu Masita. We do have another questions coming in. Uh, this time is related to the. Uh, UK policy, uh, particularly in the job retention scheme. Uh, someone is act asking about what are the factors considered by the UK government when making decision to conduct self-assessment income support system to overcome the problem. So what are the uh, considerations for the UK governments when yeah, uh, making the job retention schemes implementing implemented? So there, are, depending on the scheme, there are, are, are a number. So for SMEs and self-employed, you need to have a history. You need to have had at least two years of traded uh, taxable income. So you have to show evidence of being a going concern. And you need to give some statement on your trading activity in the current tax year, i.e. up until COVID. You need to demonstrate why your business can't continue. and. Actually, it's, it's, it should be pretty easy for most people because it's a range of things, everything from your personal circumstance, your shielding, you're affected by COVID at a family level, or your supply chain or customer base has been affected. So there's a wide range. So on the SME side, provided you can show that you are a going concern, um, those are the factors that are taken into account. You have to make the application yourself. You can't make it by intermediaries. For larger firms, this is where it gets a bit difficult. Um, a lot, some of the lending facilities uh, really initially were confined to investment grade, uh, bond buying or support for companies that, that uh, showed excellent cash flows. 
Uh, and the concern was, well, those are the companies that are likely to have the greatest reserves anyway, or should be in theory. Uh, and so there has been some controversy around, around that and gradually those have been relaxed. The final one, which I mentioned, which was, um, I'll just, I'll just uh, revisit it, is this issue of you can't have been in receipt of government money. Mm. Um, and that's a trickier one than you think because it's designed to not have public, we, we didn't want public servants being furloughed on government money. Mm. Uh, but it actually catches a number of actors who are in receipt of some form of government uh, operating grant. Uh, either through a charitable grant or a major contract. So uh, a number of large organizations, uh, including universities, but also charities, found that it wasn't as easy as they thought to furlough people. And a lot put people on furlough quickly and then found that they had to unwind it. Um, but those are principally the categories. Are you a going concern? What is your cash and investment position? And then uh, this issue around receipt of private money, or public money, excuse me. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Prof. Uh, if I just may have a follow up on that. On so far, uh, do you know how uh, how successful is it? Uh, how successful is the job retention scheme so far? I mean, in the uh, on overcoming the pandemics, uh, is that really? significant for uh, for the peoples of uh, UK and uh, in when UK governments are trying uh, are implementing the scheme? I, I, I believe so. It hasn't stopped some companies from announcing that they will trim jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen it in air, airlines, of course, uh, manufacturing companies. But I think it, it, the furlough scheme has certainly stopped a lot of companies from quite literally uh, making people redundant, you know, in March. Um, and you can imagine a lot of medium-sized enterprises that might, might employ up to 250, 300 people. They would have had every reason once you went into lockdown to just make people redundant. Uh, and the furlough scheme prevented that. So I think it actually has been uh, quite a success. It's been, it's, it's, it's incredibly expensive. Has it about a, 10 billion a month? But it has prevented literally millions, literally millions of people from becoming unemployed and claiming benefits straight away. Thank you, uh, Prof. Stephen. Uh, I just uh, had an information here that Ibu Masita will need to leave us uh, soon on 4.30 because there's an, uh, another important meeting. But uh, before that, if, I, if you may just answer one more question. There's a question about uh, villages. Uh, how government policies uh, for the villages is like uh, are the village funds, how do our policy uh, with the village fund and things related to the village if, uh, in our uh, national recovery scheme? So in the national recovery scheme for the villages and agriculture sectors that involve more informal workers, then the the support that the government gave is the most you know the most important one which is the social safety net right because this these sectors aren't touched by banking so if you give a uh, loan restructuring they probably don't really have loans uh, so the only thing that are needed are in terms of cash basis uh, but also the government is started to do with the strict covid protocol uh, more labor intensive projects uh, that are done through the subnational funding, right? This also hopefully help in terms of uh, helping people get by uh, with this uh, income uh, reduction during this uh, moment. And then also, um, if you compare to other crisis period, uh, many villagers and many agriculture or farmers uh, are increasing in number during crisis because people who usually work in the trading services in the cities in Jakarta. Uh, come back home, right, and become a farmers again. And it's relatively a subsistence system because they basically eat what they produce. Uh, but of course, that's not the only thing that one need, right? One need uh, health, uh, health, health education costs uh, to the living, right, and other other stuff. Like now, people actually need internet as primary needs uh, to work and find opportunities. 
So they still need, even though it's a subsistence level, they still need additional support from the government, which is why we are extending our social safety net into uh, villagers through the bansos uh, for outside of Jabodetabek. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ibu. Uh, I know you have Thank to you. leave uh, in a Thank short you, Pachandra. period of Thank time. Thank you, yeah. Professor Steven. I hope to catch you, up with Ibu, you for... later. Thank you. Okay. Thank Bye, you so everyone. much, Ibu. Thank yeah. you very much. Uh, okay, uh, Prof. Stephen, uh, I still ha have some questions here. Uh, before, uh, if before that, if I may invite, if there are any would like to deliver a comments or everything, just raise your hand or indicate yourself in the chat so that I can unmute you if you would like to speak directly. Um, one more question, um, uh, Prof. Stephen. Like, as the impact of the pandemic uh, unprecedentedly impact the European Union, uh, how do you think the European Union will rise to meet the likely upcoming financial crisis? I mean, will EU survive the post Eurozone financial crisis? And how does the COVID 19 crisis actually differ from that? of the last year's own financial crisis. So it's about uh, how EU as a region will escape this uh, health crisis. And if we compare it to the last year's own financial crisis, what will be the likely outcome uh, from the region? Well, that's a, that's a really interesting and difficult question. <laughs> um, let me say what I think is different this time. Uh, in, in, in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis, uh, there were asymmetric effects on EU member states uh, that were very, very severe. Um, and so uh, that was a dynamic that played itself out in the, in the general unwillingness of, of Northern Europe to consider greater mutualization of uh, financial uh, policies. Uh, that might have helped Southern Europe. I think the dynamic this time is not completely different, but is, is sufficiently different that we might see some changes. So everybody has suffered from COVID. Uh, it isn't just a Southern European problem. And crucially, you can't blame it on um, perceptions of how Southern economies work and whether they're as efficient and productive and as hardworking as Northern Europeans. That can't be said here. This was a, a pandemic. So I think you have seen some more constructive efforts in terms of creating a European response, pan-European response fund for this. I think that that has been helpful. And that has been, I think the fact that Germany has come a fair way on that is really quite interesting um, because they traditionally have the most among, among the more conservative on this. So I think I'm, I'm more optimistic than I was a few months ago about the capacity of the EU to survive this. Um, and again, much depends on a reasonably quick bounce back. I mean, Ms. Ms. Chita had uh, you know, the, the graph, the, the slide with the V-shaped recovery. If around the world this is a V-shaped recovery, we're all going to be a lot happier because these distributional questions around who gets what um, vanish if we're back to growth. So, no, I think the European Union is in a slightly better position than I thought a few months ago um, because of the recognition. I think this is a shared challenge. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for uh, that answer. Uh, it's the good to know that we're. All I think we're all optimistic about uh, how we're handling the COVID-19. And I think th that's also the spirit of the, in the regions. I don't know if uh, you happen to uh, have a bit of a knowledge on how we're doing in terms of regional uh, trade agreements in like in ASEAN or with the East Asia. But uh, do you have a, one or two takes on how uh, we should proceed with like for instance like financial integrations or a free trade more closer free trade agreements or what in the real southeast asia regions or in the east asia region um 
So financial integration, I won't. I'm, I'm not. Uh, I'm not remotely uh, expert enough to talk a bit about. It. I can talk a bit about uh, uh, trade agreements, though. Okay. Uh, my sense is, we've again we've arrived at a really interesting moment where, for months and months, I think there had been some concern about China as a as a manufacturing base. I mean, we'd seen this really going back the last two or three years under the Trump presidency. Uh, there hadn't been a dramatic amount of reshoring, uh, but there had been some, um, and we moved, it seems to me, from a situation where Southeast Asia was initially badly damaged by China-US trade rivalry, to a situation where one could imagine Southeast Asian states benefiting from the relo relocation activities as this went on. And I think COVID has, has only reinforced that. Mm. Um, and I, I, can, I can see a situation where ASEAN countries um, could benefit um, because I think there will be a lot of companies that either through their own commercial view or because of government pressure will look again at whether you, you know, they want to have all of their suppliers located in, in China or the, the bulk of them. Um, as I said, I have to be careful. I'm mindful that there is data that for all the talk about relocation out of China, there wasn't much prior to COVID. But I think with COVID as well, there's, a, there's, there's quite a bit of policy interest now in diversifying suppliers and making the supply chain area. Yeah. I, 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 I don't, I'm afraid. I, I... Uh, very uh, today, who we'll already have registered. And on the chat, uh, you can have uh, the link to fill in the survey. And I think when the survey, uh, once you fill in the survey, you will uh, you can claim your certificate. And the survey here close at 6 p.m. as the committee states. So for me, I think that's all for this afternoon. Uh, I really hope all, all of you can take a lessons. Uh, some lessons learned and from the UK and also some clarity on how the governments of Indonesia are doing policies on handling the pandemic and COVID-19. And I'd like to thank you for the Pekka and Stan as the host for the webinar and also IDP as the sponsor of the webinar. Thank you so much for sponsoring this event. And of course, the University of Sussex and Professor Stephen Maguire and all the uh, other staff that joined from the University of Sussex in this webinar. So I hope to meet you all in other occasions and thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Bye-bye everybody. Bye thank you. everybody. Bye-bye.